lose into it with her pregnancies. Um, and I, I pledge family only second to God in my life. And to hear her pain, it really, really hard for us. Um, on the other hand, I have two best days. I, I'm lucky enough to have two of the best days of my life. So most people maybe I only have one. Um, that was the day I married my wife. I instantly became a father. Four beautiful girls. And the second best day of my life was when I got a call from my wife to come down and see her at the doctor. And uh, I sat down next to her and she informed me that we would never have biological children. Um, I felt really bad for her. She was so upset. And she thought she'd, I'd be mad at her, but I, I didn't care. And the reason why it was the best day of my life was that was the day that we were able to be parents to, to foster children, to, to make a difference in their lives. But it was a a second grader that had to be put back in the first grade because of just the lack of um, parental influence in her life. We were able to show her that a normal family, we were able to come together, we help each other. It, you have clean clothes, you have food to eat. Um, we were able to show our oldest girl that we, were, we adopted that we always come back. We're always there for her. She was abandoned. Well, not so much abandoned, but anyways, don't need to get into specifics, but she worries too much for a second grader. Um, the day I got to have three boys and And always being able to be around them, to comfort them, to just be a father has been the sweetest experience of my life. And I, I just ask for leniency for, for us that we can arrange for our children to make accommodations to let them know what's going on instead of getting bad news in a phone call or on social media or something. I, I apologize that uh, I upset people. I threw the harassment and threats and uh, horrible accusations of having people accuse me of the dirtiest crime on the social media pages. We've had to monitor them. Somebody stalking our 14-year-old on Twitter one of the people on the social media pages, and so we've had to monitor them just in case we have a threat coming. We just get to have a heads up. And I apologize if I have, uh, that I upset people last night. Um, wasn't my intention. Um, That's really all I have to say, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. Malisa, M-A-L-E-I-S-A, Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S. Judge, I'm so sorry for what happened. In our home, I said it from day one. 
I had a long conversation with Heather Wicker. I let her ask all the questions she wanted. I had a long conversation with Mr. Gillette in our backyard when he came around one night. I would have had that same conversation with everybody. We put out a statement the next day. It just wasn't reported. I'm so sorry this happened. I'm so sorry all these gorgeous dogs died. I'm so sorry for all the pain that they've gone through and that we've heard today. I'm so sorry for the lies that were told after the accident about the dogs running away. It's horrible. He shouldn't have done that. I don't know why he did that. It's so out of character. Like, he's having a good panic attack or something. I don't know. I'm so sorry the AC wasn't sufficient. We had no idea. That room was ice cold all the time. We had no idea that it wasn't good enough. We changed the filter regularly. I change the filter every month. I still do. We had no idea. We had no idea. We're so sorry. If anybody, if any, I would do anything to take away that, you know, how you were your only as happy as your most unhappy kid. <laughs> I kind of feel that way. Like, I would, I would do anything to, to take this away and take their pain away. And I, nobody has portrayed me correctly, and there's been nothing I could do about it. And I, and I feel really badly about that. I'm so sorry this happened. <laughs> the lie shouldn't have been told. I just want everybody to be able to move on from this. I want to be able to forgive those people who have threatened to kill my children. I, I really do, and I want them to, and I, I want these guys to be able to forgive us. I want everybody to get some closure and be happy, and that's why I, I pled guilty to the things I pled guilty to. I, I want, if that's going to help people, then I'm fine with that. Like, I'm fine with it, but we do have some special situations here. I've got two teenage daughters who are completely under psychiatric care right now. If I go to jail today without them knowing what's going on, one of them will not survive it. I promise you that's true. Also, what hasn't been addressed, I'm happy to do the jail time. I'll go do the jail time. I'll go to Tent City. I don't care. But when we took the plea, it, it, ex it was explained to me by the other judge that the deferred sentence means that we can work it out with our family. That's what we were told. I feel like I, I've never been to court. And the judge stood right in front of me and said that she explained to us that sometimes good people make mistakes and bad things happen like this, and I was fine with that, I agree with her. But this is a horrible thing that happened, and it happened at our house. So we're responsible, I get it. But she promised me that, that my children would be protected. Besides the one child that I know would not survive. <laughs> I, I have a foster baby that I don't think you understand. Maybe you, you haven't been told. <laughs> After we quit fostering, we got the little baby we have. Well, she's, I say she's a baby. She's almost three. She's the biological daughter of the seven-year-old that we adopted. That's why she was placed with us. We don't receive any reimbursement for her. She's a kinship placement. You said she's the biological daughter of the... Sorry, the sister. I'm so sorry. Okay. And if you took uh, uh, one of us or both of us <laughs> jail today, this little girl's been in our home since the day she was born. Well, when she was, we've had her for almost three years. CPS has entrusted us with this baby, and it's, it, they, they want nothing more for this baby to stay with her sister. That's why she's placed with us. They want them to grow up together, and and they will have no choice but to remove that baby from our home. They, they're in total support of this deferred jail. Sentence. We've talked in great lengths to the baby's guardian ad litem, and she's, she understands what we did here, and she understands why, and, and she's okay with it if we can work it out where the baby's not impacted. If one of us gets, like, if we can't do the deferred jail time, I don't, you're, 
This is going to affect a human being's entire life. She'll just be ripped out of her home, away from her parents, away from her biological sister. That CPS has done everything in their power to keep these two little girls together. Please. I'm so sorry for what happened. I, I would have replaced that AC or done something different a million times, but we had been doing the business that way for, uh, for a year, and we'd never had a problem. I, I can't see the future. I never wanted it to happen. I'm so sorry. We've apologized and apologized. We had to finally quit apologizing when we heard they were going to sue us civilly, and our lawyers told us to quit apologizing. But we've apologized and apologized and apologized and apologized. We put out statements to the press, and nobody picked it up. I, I don't know what else I can do. Please, please, don't do this to my kids. I'll do the jail. But Please just let me do the jail so that my kids are least affected. Please. I'm so sorry. I want them to know that I'm so sorry. Every single one of them. I, I can't imagine what they've been going through. And I, I feel so badly that I'm responsible. But please don't do this to my children. Two children out of the seven that I still have at home will be eternally affected. Please just let me do the for a jail time. Please. Please. <laughs> Judge, I will uh, read the statements that were submitted. Um, make a comment. I think Mr. Hughes said it best. They, these letters were dictated. Um, by the plea agreement. Um, in fact, uh, the, the original letter that was submitted had to be changed because it, it didn't meet with the approval of the victims. This is less of a, a, a statement from the defendants and, and more of an, an agreeable statement that the victims would take. Both of my clients wanted to address the court in person rather than, than through a letter, and that's why, that's why they didn't want to have this be their statement. Um, Mr. Hughes's letter. I'm so very sorry for the loss of these animals. <coughs> the animals that came into our home. Um, sir, you better slow down for the court reporter. Yeah. We loved our Patrick, just as all the dog owners loved their pets. When we were in Florida and received the news, we were shocked. We rushed home and found a tragedy. A tragedy we could not imagine would ever occur. When we arrived home, we were still in shock. While trying to understand what had happened, I said some things, told some boarders what had happened, and those stories weren't true. I'm really sorry for that. I know now that those lies did no good and caused unnecessary pain. I'm also sorry for any deception that occurred throughout the case. We truly believed an electrical short caused the AC to go out. That is what we were told by the deputies and what we all believed, given the circumstances we knew at the time. To learn that the AC system was inadequate and caused the tragedy was unbelievable. But we know the AC system was our responsibility. We feel responsible for the tragedy, the suffering, and the, the loss caused to anyone, anyone, including Ashley and Alan Branch, Snickers, Francis, Tonka, and Buick, Jesus Cabrales, Sonny, Anthony and Valerie Collins, Carson and Daisy, David and Shannon Gillette, Parker and Sherman, Carrie and Jacqueline Heath, Happy, Rosie, and Chloe, Jason McIntyre, Ellie Zed, and survivor Mia, Janet Miller, Roxy, Joe Martinez, Carmen, Montez. I'm sorry. Yes. yes. You can increase the font size there. Joe Montez, Carmen, Debbie Ortiz, Macy, Barbara Martin and Gio Peraza, Coda, Michelle and David Zipser, Cash, Jan Wolfert, Sandy, Heather and Zach Wicker, Remington and Valor, Kelly Ugarete, Jeff Zizzi, Snow Abel, Catherine Horton, Ryan and Jamie Ingram. I'm for you to understand. We have had to be defensive in this process, but we have mourned and cried over the suffering and loss 
of these bets and the hurt it caused to their families. I'm sorry, Jesse Todd Hughes. <laughs> Melissa's letter. I want to start out by saying I am sorry. We welcomed these animals into our home and loved them as we did our own pets. When I first saw the awful scene when we returned home, my heart ached. I could not believe something like this happened or ever could have happened. I know that I have a strong personality and have said some things over the course of this ordeal that may have, hurt, may have been hurtful to others. Just know that the mama bear came out. But the facts as I knew them and the attacks on my family from the media and people not even involved, I was aggressively defensive. I am sorry for any hurt that I caused to those who were involved. I'm also sorry for any deception that took place throughout this case. I understand the pain and loss the other dog's owners have felt. I have cried many times because of that pain, not just for our beloved Patrick, but for the suffering and loss of the other dog owners as well. And though at the beginning I could not understand how we could be responsible for what we were told was an accident, I, know I now understand our responsibility. I apologize to any and all who are involved, including Ashley and Alan Branch, Nickers, Francis, Tonka, Buick, Jesus Cabrales, Sonny, Anthony and Valerie Collins, Carson, Daisy, David and Shannon Gillette, Parker Sher and Sherman, Carrie and Jacqueline Heath, Happy, Rosie and Chloe, Jason McIntyre, Ellie Zed and Survivor Mia, Janet Miller, Roxy, Joe Montez, Carmen, Debbie Ortiz, Macy, Barbara Martin, and Gio Peraza, Coda, Michelle and David Zipser, Cash, Jan Wilfert, Sandy, Heather and Zach, Wicker, Remington and Valor, Shelley Ugaret, Jeff, Zizzy, Snow Abel, Catherine Horton, Ryan and Jamie Ingram. This is an apology letter, but we want everyone to know that our hearts were pure. We never intended for the dogs to be harmed. I am so sorry that the AC went out. I am sorry for any deception. I am sorry for the heartache. Melissa Hughes. I've had to remind myself that you haven't been a part of this case. Um, you really don't know what happened. Uh, yeah, a picture has been painted for you in court here today of, of what took place. And to some extent, that picture has been inaccurate. And, and I want to address some of those inaccuracies and, and talk about what, what really happened. Um, as Mr. Jarvis said, the AC unit wasn't put in by our clients. It, it was the condition of the house when they bought it. The room where the dogs were kept had a, a vent that cool air blew out, but it had no return. Over the course of using the room, um, there was obviously a smell that would come if, if from a room like that, and they, they closed off one of the doors so that that smell wouldn't come into the rest of the house or into the daughter's bedroom. Part of that, part of doing that sealed off an entrance that would have provided some of the return for the air. The, their intent was not to diminish the airflow into the room. They measure airflow into the room like everybody else does. They, they go into a room, and if it's cool, it's working. And every time, several times a day, over the course of months and years that they went into that room, it was cool. The floor was cool. The dogs would lie on the floor and cool off, and it, it felt good they wanted to be in there. Um, never did they have any idea that this was an inadequate air conditioning system, that the way it was set up, that was so readily obvious to their HVAC experts that looked at it, that anybody with their level of understanding of air conditioning or yours or mine would know that this was a problem. And they weren't operating what, under what they thought was a reckless condition. They were operating under circumstances that had worked time and time again. And it wasn't like, woo, we got away with it again today. It was, this works, it works well. The dogs are happy and comfortable. Let's keep marching on doing this the way that we do it. And that's, that's the way that they were proceeding. Part of the picture that's been painted is that um, our clients are liars, that they should be vilified that they've abused social media, that they don't have respect for the court or for justice, that they aren't sorry, that they don't accept responsibility for this, and they only want to call it an accident. Um, there's no doubt that Jesse Todd Hughes lied. Um, he didn't say it directly in his comments to you, but he passed me a note and said I was nervous and 
didn't apologize to the court for the, um, the deceptions that took place immediately thereafter. He's excessively sorry for that. He regrets that. It's, it's a character flaw that he made that mistake, and it, um, it's one that, that eats at him. It, it, it causes his wife to, um, you know, when they were making statements to the sheriff's office, um, she insisted that, that he um, tell the truth and, and tell them exactly what happened. And, and from that point on, they'd done nothing but tell the truth and told exactly what has happened. One of the lies that they're, that they're trying to have <coughs> back is that they lied about this, this AC unit and the way that it went out, that a dog threw through a cable. And you know, the reality of it is is that no one really knows what went on in that room because there was, there was nobody in there. But when they went into the room, the um, wires in the wall were exposed, the sheetrock had been clawed or chewed away, and the power was off. Um, it had tripped the fuse and, and blown that fuse. Later, three, four weeks later, when an HVAC expert came out, they concluded that that electrical line had no connection whatsoever to the AC unit that was up on the roof. But everybody at the time, sheriff's office included, and the, the flakes and the hues, believed that that's what had caused the, the AC unit to go out, and that's what they were telling everybody. That's what the sheriff's office was telling everybody. That's what was in their initial reports. This wasn't a lie that they were perpetuating. This was a misunderstanding that everybody believed. Um, when, it came, when it came out that it was actually the, the setup of the HV, H, HVAC system and that the compressor um, failed, um, that was borne out by other facts. The SRP report showed a substantial power drop in use of the, of the power in the home that night, consistent with that kind of, um, of a, of a um, consequence. Um, they were, they've been called liars um, for calling the business a family environment. And, and I understand that when the, the victims who are harmed here get up, they, they don't want to believe that there's goodness and decency about these people, that they live in a home and that, they, that this was part of their family and part of their business. That was the truth. This is how they did it. The, the dogs did sleep with their kids. Not every night, not all the time, and not every dog. But they did sleep with their kids. They, they, they fell in love with these animals. You can't bring these wonderful dogs that you've seen into, into somebody's home and not fall in love with them. They're great dogs, great animals, and, and they, they treated them that, as that. Um, they didn't lie about being on vacation. The fact they didn't tell them about that is, is definitely an omission, but they, no one asked them if you are going to be here. And I don't think they were obliged to tell them they were going to be there. They had two adults that were in all respects, competent to take care of this, this business and, and do that for them. And, and again, that lie is just not a fair characterization. Um, they, they've been accused of lying about, being, about this facility being kennel free. The fact that the dogs were kept in a room during the heat of the day and at night um, didn't violate that, that statement of kennel free. It's a different kind of, um, you know, they weren't just living outside as some people thought they might be or running in and out of the house at, at, at their whim, as some people thought they might be. But that was a misunderstanding on their part. It was, they didn't hide this from anybody. It wasn't a secret room. If people wanted to see it, they were shown the room. Most people didn't know about didn't ask about it because they didn't know about it. They, they believed what they wanted to about this, and that's what they, and that's what they took from it. Um, so did your clients show Waters the room when customers would come to scout it out? If they asked to see where they would be, where they would be sleeping, they did show them the room. Many boarders saw the room. And again, Judge, here's, here's the history and the pattern. They, they did this for months and months and months with nothing but excellent reviews. If they were running this sham business with deception and lies interspersed throughout it, they wouldn't be getting these kinds of reviews and dogs coming back healthy and happy and, and boarders content with the, the services that they were receiving. Um, I, I don't dispute what was said in court today that, that these people weren't shown the room, but they didn't ask to see the room. How would they ask to see it if they didn't know what I, I don't know. I'm not saying that they had an obligation to ask to see the room. And I'm not saying that my clients had an obligation to show them that room. They, they, they had free run. Um, I, I believe it was Mr. Gillette or Mr. Banks that said that they were sit, seated 10, 15 feet away from the room where the dogs were kept when they were in the sleep room. Um, it wasn't a hidden room. It was a wall that, that shared into their, into their home. And, if, if there were animals in there and you, they were making noise, you would hear that. It was just one wall between them. It wasn't some secret place stashed back into the part of the house. Again, that's part of the vilification that's gone on, that they have this 
you know, there almost should be a soundtrack of, of you know, evil music that goes along with it. That, that's not how this was done. Um, they, they were very upfront. Come into our home, have a seat on our couch. These are our kids. These are our animals. We would love to have your animals be a part of our family, and that's the way they ran it. I mean, and I understand why the, the victims are upset about that, and they wouldn't want to say that, that they were honest and truthful about that, but you've heard other people that have been in their home, that have been their next-door neighbors for years, that have seen how they ran their business, that they were out in the yard, that the dogs were outside all day long. One of the lies that's perpetuated is that they, they stuffed these dogs in the room and locked them up to die. Some of the quotes that were said today. And I, I understand that's a, it's a, an, it's an impassioned statement made at a, at, a, at a hearing like this, but it's just simply not true. They didn't stuff the dogs into the room. They didn't leave them there to die. They put them there because it was a cool, safe place for them to be where they could get rest. I don't know if you're a dog owner. Dogs sleep 20 hours out of the day. They would love to sleep all the time. And they loved going into this room where they could lay down in a cool place and sleep. And they were happy about that. They, that's the way Todd and Lisa ran it. And that's the way the, the, the dogs treated it. Um, phrases like killed our dogs. I mean, that's, that's an intentional thing that they killed these dogs. I understand that choices that they made resulted in the death of these dogs, but it's, it's not the same kind of thing. There's been comments made to you today, Judge, about food and water deprivation and about sedation of dogs. These were allegations that were made in this case that were never proven. There was no allegation, there was no proof that these dogs weren't fed and watered correctly. Um, there was no proof or evidence that there was ever any type of sedation taken. Again, I think that they think that, that they're, and they're vilifying of our clients, that they took them in, they gave them some type of sedative and then didn't feed them the water so they wouldn't defecate or urinate and put them in this room where they, they sat all day long so they could go about their business. That just doesn't bear out. Their neighbors, their family members, the people that were there saw that, that that's not how it was done. And, and so, again, that's part of the vilification, calling them monsters, um, comparing them to murderers. Um, one of the interviews I did, they, they, com they likened cramming these dogs into this room to, to loading up cars of, of Jews to ship off to Auschwitz. It, I mean, crazy accusations like that, they just simply are trying to vilify them and, and make them into the people that they, they believe that they are, that they, they simply aren't, that they're mean people. I, I think it was the, uh, the, um, the doctor or the detective that, that said that these are truly unpleasant people. You've got to take that statement in context, Your Honor. This was, their exposure to them was the day that their front door was kicked in, that their children were taken out of their beds at the early hours of the morning. They were lined up like criminals um, while they went through their home with a search warrant under circumstances that are not good. I would not want to be judged about my character or my meanness based on how I reacted under those types of circumstances. I hope that never happens to me or anybody else. But to judge them based on how they treated these people and, and the way they reacted to that kind of treatment under those types of circumstances is not a fair judgment. Um, how they, they act the rest of the time, the things that you've heard about their neighbors, the ones that know them, that see them all the time, that's, that's a fair judgment of, of the, the character and type of people that they are. I, I believe that, that Your Honor has seen the video of, of a news account between Melissa and, and several news reporters. I want to put that in context as well. This was hours after this incident took place. Bear in mind it was a full three, four weeks before anybody really understood what had happened. And at that time, they had been told that this was an accident, that the AC went out because of the wire being chewed through, and that they weren't responsible for that. Yet everybody was in the press was attacking them and vilifying them based on the loss of these dogs. And, and I understand that because it, it's horrible what's happened to these dogs. There's no other way to say that. As a, as a dog owner, a dog lover myself, uh, it, that pains me. But to attach that on the hues necessarily at that time, under the circumstances and what they knew, was not appropriate or fair. And Melissa, Mother Bear came out in her. And she responded to that and acted in the way. She was not nice. She was not pleasant. But these people were attacking her, her reputation and her family in a way that she didn't think was fair. The way that she believed, and so did the sheriff's office, was not fair at the time. And so I ask you not to, to put too much of a judgment based on that. They attempted to vilify them by the use of the shed. This is one of those, of, of storing the dogs in the shed. This is one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't. I, I don't know. Someone said earlier there's no manual for raising kids. That's a line I've used many times. There's no manual for dealing with a crisis like this either. I, I, don't, know, I don't know how you, you do it with that. Where do you put the dogs? What do you do with them? The sheriff's office didn't take them. Um, 
one agency called up and agreed to take some of them and cremate them for them as a, as a courtesy. But I don't, what do you do with that? You, you, you put them in a shed, you, you store them until you can do something with them. What, they're disposed of, people can be notified, whatever. It, it was not a pretty situation. Again, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, they tried to treat the, the animals humanely and, and kindly. They loved these animals and they, they treated them that way. Um, it, it, there was never any allegations or, or proof that they tried to bury these dogs or hide these dogs. They're not calloused about this. Um, the picture of the, the room showing the dogs to scale and things like that, it's, it's a little bit deceptive, Your Honor. As Mr. Jarvis said, many of the dogs were kept in, in kennels that were put up on shelves or stacked up on top of each other because that's the way the owners wanted it. So not all of them would be standing on the floor. Some of the surface area and the usableness of that room were these, these shelves that were along the one wall. Um, <coughs> with regard to the social media, uh, Mr. Hughes said it um, pretty effectively this morning. They have been, the family has been attacked, they've been threatened seriously. And as parents and as foster parents, they have to be diligent and vigilant with regard to what's going on. I understand the sensitivities of the victims and, and trying to find ways that they can come in here to court and say that they're disrespecting the plea agreement. But to go on to social media on the day of this event and see if there's any dangerous postings or any threatening postings involving their kids, we're going to be left home alone today without them there. Um, and could be subjected to who knows what, given the history of this case. And that's not someone being overreactive or overprotective. That's straight up supported by what's happened in this case. For them to go on to that and log into that, not post, not comment, and look at it, it isn't a violation of the spirit of any type of plea agreement. It's just a parent doing their job. Um, I won't comment on the, uh, well, by not commenting, you comment on it. I think parents could do a better job of mon monitoring social media and things like that in the home. Um, the dangers that come to that are, are, um, are prevalent and, and well known. Um, commenting, you've heard about the comment that they made the day that the plea went through. This was a great day. This, this, that was a great day. Not because they were snubbing their nose at the, at the court or at the prosecutor or at the victims, but because that was the beginning of the end. That was the beginning of the wrapping up of this long, long ordeal. They had stood up in court. They had done what they had been wanting to do, which was to accept responsibility under, under terms that they had negotiated for sure. But that is a great day. They didn't mock anybody. They didn't taunt anybody. This was a comment that was made to their daughter on, on Instagram. It wasn't something that they posted for all to see. And you know, that's, that's part of the thing. Everybody thinks social media is private. It's not. When you say something, you say it to everybody. It, everything is on the Internet. The picture of the... Um, that the victims complained about today, about the, the dog and the cat and the rabbit. That was a picture posted by their daughter. It wasn't a p picture posted by Todd or Melissa. This was a picture posted by their daughter. Um, it, this was a gift to the kids. This wasn't a dog that Todd and Melissa acquired. This was a gift to their kids. They, they love animals, and, and they gave them a dog. Uh, I, I don't, they're good people with animals. Uh, despite what Dr. Mangone said about them, uh, they, their history with animals is, is good, they care about them, they do what they can for them. Um, with regard to the respect for the court or, or justice, um, comments were made about looks and sneers and smirks and eye rolls and things like that. Uh, you can't read into a person's mind what they're saying when they make a facial expression or a body gesture or things like that. You're going to be right as often as you're wrong. And, and I think to, to judge their character and, and things like that based on, based on uh, reactions that they make when they see someone they're not expecting to see in the cafeteria of court or walking down the hall is, is not proper, it's not appropriate, and I hope you won't give any consideration to that. Um, with regard to their remorse, uh, we appreciate your ability to judge that, Your Honor. Um, these are not people that, aren't, or that don't show remorse for this. They've shown remorse from the beginning. You've heard several of the victims get up today and say that they were told by either Todd or Melissa that they were sorry, that they expressed their sorrow about what had happened. Um, I understand that lying to people is not how you express sorrow, but, but they did express to many of the, the, the sorrow that they felt. They're not sorry for getting caught. They weren't doing something that they thought they were going to get caught doing. They weren't doing something that, and we got away with it for another day. 
They were running a business. They were keeping dogs in a room that was set at a temperature that was cooler than the rest of the house. They thought they were treating these dogs well. They didn't think that the air conditioner was going to go out. No one other than an HVAC expert would have thought that that would have been a result. And, and so as a result of that, um, to, to say that they're sorry for getting caught, they're sorry that this came about. They're sorry that this happened, but it, it's not how they got caught. It wasn't like they'd been stealing from somebody for months and months and they finally figured it out. This was, this was just a, a horrible tragedy that happened, for which they're responsible. And I think, I think that's important, Your Honor. There's, um, there is a, um, um, saying that something is an accident doesn't mean that you're not responsible. Accident happen, accidents happen every day on the freeways and in workplaces that someone's responsible for, but it's still an accident. And when they say that this is an accident, they're not saying we don't accept responsibility for that. They're just saying that, that this was an accident. No one intended for this to happen. They clearly didn't intend to harm these animals in this way. And, and I don't seriously think there's anybody that really believes that about them. But they never left the animals with them. They had that kind of depravity. To, to com Again, Dr. Mangoni was talking about how equating animal cruelty to how bad that is because people that will treat animals that way is what they would do to others, humans amongst us. Um, I think that's probably true. I've read our articles myself like that about people that intentionally harm animals. That's not what we're talking about here. There's never been any allegation of intentional harm to, these, to any of these animals. This was all reckless or negligent. Every allegation was reckless or negligent. They weren't intending to do this. Yes, he intentionally lied about it. Yes, they intentionally ran this business. Yes, they intentionally left town. But those intentional acts aren't what caused these animals to die. It was the accident of the air conditioning going out that caused these animals to die. And the only people that are responsible for that are Todd and Melissa here. So the only ones that are here. Some of the other things that have been attempted to be hoisted upon them with regard to responsibility and their sorrow is the way the animals were treated immediately thereafter. And, and you, I think you probably picked up on that, that Todd and Elise were out of town, that they weren't there when the first aid was rendered. They weren't there when the decision to call it that was needed to be made. They were on a plane. They were, in the, they were scrambling to get their family back together and back home. Um, they, were, they were not in a position to be making decisions about that. And, and the people that were in a position to make a decision about that decided that calling a vet was not going to be a, a, a beneficial thing to do. Was that a mistake? Maybe. I don't know. I wasn't there. But... It, it, I don't think it's as simple as we call a vet and they come out and, and fix everything. They, there's no ambulance service for dogs. They would have had to load up the remaining dogs in the car and taken them somewhere, leaving this horrific situation untended um, while, the, while they did that. Uh, and the kids uncared for. It was just it was an unideal situation with unideal um, resolutions trying to get through it. But to try and blame Todd and Melissa for the first aid that was rendered or the decisions that were made immediately thereafter when they weren't even there, I, I think is unfair and, and in no way reflects the responsibility for what they did. They've accepted responsibility for what they've done, but they didn't make those decisions. They're not responsible for that. Um, Your Honor, um, with regard to the punishment, and I'll conclude um, with this. Your experience on the bench, you know that there are consequences that come from these types of cases that are, that are oftentimes unintended and that are significantly punitive. And I would ask that you take in consideration some of those consequences. Many of them have been presented to you already in court today. Um, my clients have lost their businesses and any ability that they've had to provide any kind of an effective living for their family. They, they have been living on the, um, the graces of other people and support and, and scrounging for all of their means. Uh, this has been a tremendous challenge for them with, with a young family. Um, it, it's a significant consequence. It's caused them to suffer and their children to suffer. and. Um, have caused them to make choices that affect the everyday lives of their children. Um, family has had to 
forego other choices to come in and help them and support them. And I don't think they regret that, but it, it's a consequence nonetheless. Uh, Jesse's mother and father are here in court and other family members that are here to support them. We're serving a mission for their church in Alaska, a lifelong dream to be able to do that, and they had to cut that short and come home and support their family financially and with other support. Um, the, the kids suffering, we've, we've talked about that. You've, you've seen the threats that, have, that they've, they've had. Um, we've talked about that, the, the, the psychiatric struggles that they've been having. Um, effectively, the family's been on house arrest for the last two years um, because of the, the hawking over them by the, the media and, and their neighbors that, that um, have caused problems for them. They've been in the spotlight in not a good way. Um, They've lost privacy. They've been vilified and attacked on social media in manners in which they can't defend themselves. They've been accused of false things, false reports of tax fraud, of CPS, of abusing their kids. CPS about numerous times because of calls that have been made to them anonymously. Every time nothing's come of it, of course. Um, the, uh, we've addressed the, the issue with regard to the way the, the, the crimes were investigated that took place to their family members. Um, just as a follow-up judge, while we've been here, we've had communication with um, Sheriff Allred from Graham County. He is available to confirm his willingness to do this if the court is not willing to accept an email, and I understand that, but he is available and will, would be willing to take a call um, if the court is, is willing to consider that. And I just I, I give that to you for your decision there, Judge. Um, but I ask that you consider the, the punishment that they, they've suffered already. I've only listed some, there's many others. Um, Jail time is a, um, I appreciate Mr. Jarvis's talking about other cases where intentional acts of, of cruelty towards animals took place, where substantial neglect of animals was, and when we're talking about neglecting animals, we're talking about not feeding them, not caring them, not providing them a shade or shelter or water. Um, that's not what was going on here. The neglect was they didn't know that they had a, uh, an air conditioning system that experts knew was not sufficient, but they had no idea that it was, it was insufficient because every time they went into the room it worked just fine and they never had a problem with it. That's the, the level of culpability in this case. They weren't acting badly towards these animals. They weren't mistreating them. They weren't doing anything like that. And, and as a result of that, I think that the 23 days in jail, regardless of what's been said about them wanting to have more punishment today, is more than sufficient to send a serious message. A day in jail for most people is, is all of it is never needed. The individuals that, that will be standing here before you today as you give your sentence here in a few minutes have, have lived their lives essentially free of any type of crime. Jesse had a, a DUI years ago, but no type of criminal behavior or criminal activity. They're law-abiding, honest, good, decent people that, that we want in our community. And a day in jail for them is, is sufficient um, 23 days in jail is, is, is more than sufficient, and we firmly believe that 23 days in jail served as enough time. Specifically, Judge, we're asking you to defer um, the sentences so that they can split up this jail time. I, I, I do not attribute this characteristic to you, Your Honor, but I, I, I find it cruel to ask that if the, the jail sentences are going to be staggered, that Melissa start first. I think the victims know that this is going to be particularly painful to my, to my client, Melissa Hughes. And to, to ask that if they're going to be staggered, that she serves it, serve it first is, is cruel. Not to her. She said to you, she'll do the 23 days in jail. She'll do it any way that you want her to do it. She's submitted herself to your jurisdiction and your authority, and she will take whatever you give her. But don't do that to her kids. It's not necessary. They need to do 23 days in jail, and whether they do it today or in three weeks from today, it doesn't really matter. The jail time is going to be served. The punishment is going to be affixed, and, and it will have to be told. But to, to have them serve it at the same time, to have her or to have her serve it first and, and punish the kids unnecessarily, I just I, I don't I think that that's unnecessary. Um, the the small foster child that they they currently have that they're hoping to adopt. We've had extensive communication with the guardian ad litem. She's completely understanding of everything that's going on and supportive of, of what's happening. But they absolutely want um, the, the sentences to be staggered so that, that somebody 
can, can remain in this home and give a continuity to this family. Um, you have the authority to defer the jail sentence. You can't delete it. Um, and so it's completely within your authority to exercise that discretion. I, I think that it sends, I mean, they're always talking about in the letters and things and in their statements today about sending a message. It sends a serious message that, that an accident occurs for which they've accepted responsibility. Um, suffering took place. And, and as a result of that, someone's going to serve over three weeks in jail. I understand that it's figurative, this 23 days, it's represented above the 23 dogs, um, but uh, effectively that's a long time in jail. People commit serious crimes that don't do that amount of jail time. And, um, and, and we ask that, y that you temper that as much as you can. Uh, I, I've been doing this a long time. I, I've never had somebody do a concurrent or consecutive probation sentence under the terms that are considered here. And, the, and have I, have, I, have I heard the explanation for that, that th they're fearful that they're going to start this business again? Um, there's been no attempt by the Hughes to, to re reignite this business, to do anything with it. They've shut it down. It was shut down from, from, um, from the, almost the, the inception. They fulfilled their, a couple of ob obligations that they had, and then they stopped doing it. Um, a fair amount of that is because of all of the negativity that's gone on in social media. They, they're, they're pariahs at that point. They, they couldn't run a business um, of that type if they, if they wanted to, but they don't want to. They're not trying to. As a condition of probation, they've been prohibited from doing that. Um, I submit, Judge, that you give them the 230 days of, of deferred jail sentence. The 23 initial jail sentence that, that you're going to give them defer it, stagger it so they, they can serve that in the manner that's punitive to them but supportive of their family, and then sentence them to an additional 230 days that is deferred, as was suggested by the state. If, if they do anything at all, and you don't even need to have the deferred jail time there. I mean, I know I'm telling you what your authority is, but if they do anything at all, you can reject their probation and sentence them to prison if you want to, assuming that there's support for that and in, in, in due process is given, of course. But the 230 days in jail sends a real message that they need to toe the line and follow every requirement. Yes. They need to do everything that they can do, um, that they intend to do while they're on probation, to, to be compliant. In the, in the two years that they've been on release and been supervised by the court in, in various forms and fashions, they've not done anything to violate that. They've not done anything to break the law. They've not done anything to attack the victims or anything like that. Um, they have defended themselves. They've made accusations when the victims got up and said that she was accused of, of uh, threatening them. Well, that wasn't a lie. There was actually a threat. Uh, that they believed that it was her, it sounded like her, it, they had familiarity with her voice, that's who they thought that it was. Uh, the, the investigation that was done to that came to its own conclusions. I just don't think that consecutive probation is necessary. They don't need that type of monitoring. If they do, the probation can be extended. Um, that's a, a tool that is available to the court. Uh, I think that two years of probation is ample. Um, it can be extended beyond that, and it can be terminated early if it's not needed. Um, I appreciate the court's uh, position on community service. Uh, we would like that to be left to the discretion of adult probation to decide what that should be. Um, Your Honor, the people that stand before you are not the ones that have been described um, by the state and, and by the victims. Um, they are good, decent, caring people that made a mistake and that were subject to a, a horrible tragedy, an accident for sure, an accident for which they're responsible for, but it doesn't change the fact that it was an accident. Nobody can convince anybody that this was an intentional act or that it was something that anybody other than an expert should have known would have occurred. And, and based on that, based on their criminal history, based on their remorse, based on their, their um, um, acceptance of responsibility, we ask that you sentence them in, in accordance with the plea agreement to 23 days in jail and then, and then defer the additional jail time as a, uh, an incentive and as a message. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Judge, we don't have anything else to present to the court at this time. All right. Would you like to, where would you like our clients at this time, Your Honor? Uh, they can remain there. That's fine. So there's a lot uh, the court's heard today, and uh, Mr. Smith emphasizes the point that uh, what caused the dogs to die was an accident and not intentional. Uh, the court believes it was not intentional. 
I mean, I don't think the victims believe that the Hughes wanted their animals to die. But there's more to it than that because of the misrepresentations made to the um, owners of the dogs such that they weren't in a position to make an informed choice about whether that was an appropriate place for them to leave their dogs or not. I mean, that's, in the, in the court's view, that's one of the biggest um, problems with the, with the case from the defense side, as well as the fact that I don't care how many of those dogs were on shelves and kennels and crates, et cetera, that's a massive amount of dogs in that size room, even if the air conditioning was working. And I do speak from the perspective of having lived with dogs my entire life. So, um, you know, that's one of those things you just can't separate when you're um, a judge on a case, just like I'm a parent. So when I have cases where children have been abused or children have been harmed or whatever, um, I'm still appropriate to make decisions in the case, but it does give you a different um, or a more informed perspective about what everybody really has been saying today, both from the Hughes' perspective and the victim's perspectives. I think um, you need to acknowledge right out of the box that there's really no way to impose a penalty equal to the loss suffered by the victims. Just look at the number of the victims. The sheer number is really remarkable. Uh, there are not many cases in which you have this many owners. I mean, the cases that you talked about, um, Mr. Javis, I didn't, I didn't hear um, how many different owners of the animals at issue we were speaking about. It sounded like in one instance the, the defendant was actually the owner of all those animals, the one that you said was the hoarder. Is that right? Yeah, the, they were the her McKell, Yeah, the McKell was, was hers, the, the hoarder of the... Of the Horses, I believe those were all boarded. You said those were boarded. Were boarded, yes. Yes. So, so what? When I say there is no way to impose a penalty uh, equal to the loss suffered by the victims, there just isn't. That's you know, from all of our life experiences, everybody who's um, owned dogs, you understand that there's there's. It's not an overstatement. I think I heard several people say today that um, their dogs were their children. That's not an overstatement. You know, dogs are exactly like uh, children in the sense that they rely on us to take care of them fully. You have to feed them, you have to shelter them, you have to protect them from harm, and they give us uh, back everything that we get from them. But dogs trust their owners to do that, just like kids trust their parents to take care of them. Really, that's in large part, what I see here is the Hughes violated that trust and that responsibility when they took on these dogs under the circumstances that they presented to the dog's owners, uh, and then the dogs died in the manner in which they died. They're, everyone agrees it's, it's, it's horrible. Uh, I think the victims being able to speak about uh, dogs, particularly Geo, it was unusual when I often see photos in connection with uh, sentencing. Some of them are horrible photos, but some of them are um, joyful photos like I saw with a lot of these dogs as I looked at them all last night and they um, were pictures of them with their families and family members, etc. And I did not know at that time um, that Gio had Asperger's, but his the photos of Gio and Florida <coughs> were to me just really striking. Um, you could, that bond was palpable in those photos and I think uh, Gio coming in and talking today, particularly not to make light or minimize anyone else's comments, but um, I think that just shows the level of um, impact for someone with Gio's issues to come in and do what he did, shows the impact that all of this has had on the owners. The, um, court has heard really with distress what the Hughes have described about impact on their children. Death threats against anyone is unacceptable completely, much less uh, against a child. And I think that's all part of the unfortunate sort of roller coaster that people get on when they are dragged into or are somehow involved in matters like this that attract the public attention. Um, in the court's view, the <coughs> stipulations are generally uh, perfectly appropriate. The court does not believe prison is necessary here. It does believe that 
substantial terms of probation are warranted. Uh, one of the things for the benefit of people in the courtroom who were not there when I took the, when the lawyers came back to see me in chambers this morning, I did express concern about uh, the stipulations paragraph where it noted that there was going to be a recommendation the defendants complete their community restitution at the Maricopa County Animal Control. The court uh, would not order that under any circumstances given the facts of these cases and finds uh, that the word I used with the lawyers was irrational. I noted that was the same word that the doctor used. I asked the state why in the world they would be recommending that and they indicated that there were victims who uh, thought that that might be appropriate. Uh, the court, from my perspective, having seen what I've seen over 14 years on the bench, would absolutely not find appropriate to order someone to do community service in a setting where the type of um, the type of individuals who are victimized were potentially at risk again. So the court will not be ordering that. I will be ordering absolutely the. Um, the uh, community service, but I will leave it up to the probation department as we customarily do. They have a list of who's appropriate or who's available, who qualifies at that time, who has openings, etc. So I'm going to leave that to the probation department to do. Uh, the state has recommended for each defendant consecutive terms of probation, and while that's, uh, I think Mr. Smith indicated he'd never seen that imposed before. Uh, prosecutors can probably address this. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think it was when I was off of criminal that that became possible for a period of time. When I was on criminal the first go around many years ago, that was not uh, even lawful. Uh, but it became lawful. The law changed. And there were certainly instances in which that appears to be appropriate. Here we've got uh, class six undesignated felonies. So the maximum amount of probation the court could order, and as Mr. Smith pointed out, probation can be extended the most that anyone could extend it to would be three years. That's the maximum amount of time for a class six undesignated. So in the court's view, uh, it is certainly appropriate to impose probation terms on all four of these counts. And uh, it is the judgment of the court that imposition of sentence is suspended. And on each one of these counts, two as to Mrs. Hughes, two as to Mr. Hughes, uh, the defendant is placed on supervised probation for three years the court is going to run them consecutively to one another. I think that's appropriate given the nature of the harm, the extent of the harm, the number of victims, and the fact that the Hughes, while they may have never <coughs> had any problem with animals in the past, uh, there's just a massive amount of uh, anguish and damage and just irreparable harm that was caused and for the for them to be supervised in terms of continuing access to animals and care of animals, the court finds that to be absolutely appropriate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to order first that the cruelty to animal count for each co-defendant begin first. That is to begin today in terms of probation for each uh, of Mr. and Mrs. Hughes. And then uh, that will be for three years and upon completion of that, the facilitation to commit fraud schemes three years of probation, supervised probation will run. The court orders under each of these four counts, and I'm speaking um, collectively about both co-defendants, that uh, they not have any victim with, uh, not have any contact with any victim whatsoever, that uh, they not consume or possess any substances containing alcohol, a standard term of probation. In addition, there are specific stipulations that have been reached. I'm going to come back to jail at the end, but first, it's ordered the defendants shall not acquire any new animals. It's ordered they shall not operate or work in any boarding facilities for animals. It's ordered that they perform at least 230 hours of community restitution. And I'm imposing, imposing that specifically on count two, the animal cruelty count. It's further ordered they not comment, discuss, and or post about this case on social media. And the court would find that the letter of apology uh, as required has been written and has been provided read here in court today. DNA testing is ordered as to all four counts um, as the law requires. On each uh, count two, the cruelty to animals, the court imposes the financial terms that are required. And that would be the $65 a month probation service fee, the $2 victim assessment, the $13 penalty assessment, and the $20 uh, probation assessment. With respect to jail, 
Um, I've heard a lot about jail today, and what I'm reading, uh, counsel, is we've got uh, different stipulations. As to Mr. Hughes, it reads, quote, defendant shall serve an initial jail term of 23 days, not to be deleted, without the possibility of work release, work furlough, home detention, or compliance monitoring. Differently, um, Mrs. Hughes's stipulation reads, defendant shall serve flat jail term of 23 days not to be deleted. So the word initial was struck without the possibility of work release, work furlough, home detention, or compliance monitoring. That is correct, Your Honor. And the court uh, recognizes that 23 is the floor. The court in any, um, on any probation count, I could do it on both of these counts for each defendant if I thought that was in the interest of justice, can impose up to one year flat in the county jail. The court uh, believes that as to each of the co-defendants, 60 days in jail is appropriate on the animal cruelty count. The court will not order them to be served concurrently, meaning Mr. and Mrs. Hughes do not need to go to jail at the same time. The court uh, would find that to be somewhat of a distortion of really um, an appropriate sentence. Each defendant is being sentenced individually by being required to serve 60 days flat in the county jail. Uh, it would serve no purpose but in the court's view to harm the defendant's family members, including the multiple children, to require them to be without their parents at the same time. The court would order Mr. Hughes's jail term to begin today and Mrs. Hughes's jail term to begin uh, January 2nd, 2017. Those are 60 days flat in jail. Uh, the issue of where uh, is not an issue, as I said, that um, anyone gave me uh, information ahead of time for me be, to be able to sort that out and figure out if that's feasible. I don't know, Mr. Smith, when you say, um, who did you say was available to, to speak? Graham County, the Sheriff of Graham County. The problem is, um, you know, just as a legal matter, I mean, the Sheriff is in charge of his jail there, but he's not, he's not the person who's going to um, have any involvement with the supervision of probation. So I think we've got, we've got an issue here, Mr. Smith. I think perhaps uh, given how late it is now, 10 minutes to 5 on a Friday afternoon, it, let me ask this. Does the state have any position on that issue? Your Honor, the state would object to uh, serving incarceration in Graham County. The state believes that since that the defense haven't met, met the threshold to establish a need to move to Graham County for the jailing, so we would oppose it, Your Honor. I understand that your clients are not um, comfortable with and have concerns about MCSO, but as I've said, uh, the court confronts that on a regular basis. Once people are in custody, they are often um, lodging complaints, filing lawsuits, arguing about things that are being done in jail or not being done in jail. And it's, I really, I don't think I've been presented with enough here to give me a basis to do anything other than what would be expected, which is um, Mr. Hughes will do his jail term in Maricopa County Jail, uh, and then when Mrs. Hughes arrives in January, she will do the same. There are other terms and conditions of uh, these probation grants. I have not covered all of them. They all will appear in writing in the documents uh, that Mr. and Mrs. Hughes will receive today. As to all four of these counts, they are class six undesignated felonies. If the defendants violate their terms of probation, their probation grants could be revoked and then they could be sentenced to prison for up to two years on each and every count. If they successfully complete probation on any one or more of these counts, then they have the opportunity to earn a misdemeanor. Mr. and Mrs. Hughes, you do have the right to petition for post-conviction relief from the orders of the court and to have a lawyer represent you. If you can't afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you. If you can't afford the records and transcripts that you need, those also will be provided to you free of cost. If you wish to petition for post-conviction relief, you must file that notice within 90 days from today or you lose the right to seek that relief. You'll also need to sign a copy of your rights to review and your conditions of probation. And while I mentioned it earlier, I did um, not say very clearly that the uh, 230 hours of community restitution is being ordered as well. I, maybe I said that. That is under count two. 
pursuant to the plea agreement as to each co-defendant, it is ordered dismissing counts 3 through 29 and the allegation of multiple offenses. Any bond is ordered exonerated. Mr. Hughes is remanded to his jail term, and Mrs. Hughes does need to report to the probation office within 72 hours of today, which would be next week. Your Honor? Yes. I'm sorry. You have Mrs. Hughes going in on January 2nd? Yes. Her oldest daughter that was mentioned today is pregnant and is due to deliver on January 1st, and she has in the past had very difficult pregnancies, actually lost them, and were stillborn. Is it possible we could have January 15th as the report date for Mrs. Hughes? I'm fine with that. Is the State fine with that? It is, Your Honor. January 15th will be her self-surrender date. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Chung, Mr. Umpleby, anything further from the State? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything from defense? No, Judge. Thank you. We are adjourned. I did not lie. I did not lie. I never lied. There's nothing else she can do for me.